Hi and welcome to another episode of Straight Out of Camera, proudly sponsored by Fuji Film South Africa. Joining me live in studio is Managing Director of TechSmart.co.za, Mike Huber, and in Cape Town, commercial photographer, Leon Westhazen. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Ashley. How are you? Good. Hi, hi. Good morning, guys. So today is episode 13, and we are chatting about the second most popular genre of photography in South Africa. It is landscape photography. But we're putting a little bit of a twist on it. We are talking about infrared landscape photography. Now, Leon, there's two ways of capturing infrared images. You can either use filters that screw on top of a lens, or you can buy a filter that is mounted or placed in front of your sensor. And the second second option is obviously a lot more expensive, but there's definitely a change in the way the image process is using either one of these two technologies. Yes, yeah, that's that's true, Esli. Um, when, you, when you start to take a look at um, capturing infrared images, obviously you're working with a, a spectrum of light that's not visible to the naked eye, so uh, that, that means that a regular sensor would have to be converted. Um, Obviously, also, when you're shooting in digital, if you want to do film, you get infrared film. That's one thing that's set aside and it's specifically designed for that. When you're working with infrared digital imagery, your sensor itself has to be sensitive to infrared light. And that you'll be able to check out, for instance, when you point a TV remote at your camera um, and, and pr- press one of the buttons while you're exposing. And then you'd be able to see that that. Um, little diode at the front that you would normally point towards your TV or hi-fi, um, that will light up. And then you know your, your camera is capable of capturing um, infrared light. And typically your newer cameras don't do that that well by default because the filters in front of the sensors have come along. Um, the, the alternative is to have an infrared filter if you don't convert your, fil- uh, your, your sensor, is to have a filter placed in front of your lens if you already know that your sensor is capable of capturing that infrared light. But that has that has an adverse effect um, because with a with an infrared filter, you typically lose um, upwards of seven stops of light, or maybe even more sometimes. Or with a with a sensor conversion, um, it may not be any light at all, or um, depending on which filter you you apply. So so there are shutter speed differences um, for the same lighting situations when you do shoot landscape. If you want those crispy clouds and and uh, leaf uh, situations and trees, then you really want to go for something that's faster. Mike, pioneers in the infrared photography genre? I think a lot of credit has to go to American uh, physicist and inventor Robert W. Wood, who's called the father of both infrared and actually uh, ultraviolet photography around the turn of the previous century. He was uh, the first to intentionally produce photographs from infrared radiation, and that strange white glow Leon talked about a little bit earlier from foliage in infrared photos is actually called the Wood effect. He's certainly a renaissance man, being also the first to photograph sound waves. He's the inventor of tear gas. Uh, He did a lot of groundbreaking research in the field of ultrasound. He co-authored a science fiction novel and actually illustrated children's books. So, um, yeah, Wood is also one of the very few humans that has an area of the moon uh, named after him called Wood Spot. (laughs) And your best photographers that you can mention in this genre? There's a couple of interesting guys. Uh, In the 60s, uh, Kodak in the UK gave a photographer, Carl Ferris, what was at that stage military infrared film, um, which was initially developed for the U-2 spy plane. They wanted to see if he could find a commercial purpose for it. And he uh, went out with a fisheye lens, came back with these trippy psychedelic images for uh, rock stars such as Donovan and uh, the Jimi Hendrix experience. Another guy is uh, Richard Moss, uh, Irishman, and he used Kodak aerochrome film to photograph the conflict in uh, the De- Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, these photos evoke a really strange emotion. It's almost discombobulating in a sense because what they display is or depict is military men in conflict situations surrounded by the strange pink hues of infrared photography that in certain cases, you know, it completely detaches the aggression from the subject matter. But I think when it comes to pure amazing images, French photographer David Kyokirian stands out. I'm not sure if I present or said that correctly. But anyways, it's safe to say that he's certainly mastered the art of infrared photography. Paging through his Flickr account, it's, it's clear that he not only understands the medium and certainly the post-processing involved in there, 
but um, he's also on top of his game in another in a number of different uh, techniques, including uh, long exposure and nighttime photography. So yeah, we'll put the, we'll put links into the podcast description. Follow us on soc underscore live, both on Instagram and on Facebook, where we will have links of the um, photographers mentioned. Johan von der Walt is an amateur photographer who takes his hobby seriously. How seriously, you might ask? Well, Johan joined the Photographic Society of South Africa in 2002 to eventually be elected president in 2011, where he served for two years. In 2014, he received a fellowship from the Royal Photographic Society, while he is also an honorary member of the China Photographers Association and South Africa's representative at the Global Photographic Union. Johan lectures part-time in photography locally, as well as at international photography festivals, and sat on the international judging panel for the 15th China International Photographic Art Exhibition. Here to talk about infrared photography, Yuan, welcome to the Straight Out of Camera podcast. Thank you. Before we get into the intricacies of today's topic, you do strike me as the type of gentleman that, like so many of our other guests, not only approaches photography from an artistic point of view, but certainly from a technical one too. Yes, uh, I am technically inclined um, being a computer programmer um, as my daytime job uh, so I, I always need to read up I'm, I'm the type of guy that will actually go through the manual before I even buy the equipment <laughs> um, Johan uh, when, um, when you uh, started out in photography did, did you already uh, have an inkling uh, as to what you would do with with infrared or is this something that just uh, as your exploration of photography came on this is something that you stumble across and um, started to explore more in depth how, how did you how did you get your hands on it i uh, when i started photography uh, in film days i actually also experimented um, with infrared film um, we we were a bunch of guys, students at that stage, um, and we actually experimented in, in many different things in photography, and infrared was one of it. But uh, it was not very successful. I actually don't have many of my photos of that time that I could actually show people. Um, I have two at the moment that I actually found in my archives um, that I photographed close to the end of my film days in 2003 in, in um, Australia, where I uh, used infrared just to get something different than the normal shots that you will get when you photograph uh, w while traveling. Johan, your approach to landscape photography, obviously um, you, you have a passion for it, so I want to first find out why landscape photography, and then how there's a difference between normal landscape photography and infrared landscape photography because obviously um, you've got to look at the landscape and actually compose um, in a different way for infrared. Can you maybe express that a little bit? Uh, yes, and that is most probably also why it was not very successful in the film days because nowadays with infrared on a digital camera you can actually see your results directly and then recompose uh, or uh, change your angle towards the sun or whatever that you, after you've seen it, because the infrared is not what we see with visible light. It has a very different uh, uh, effect on on the result. Um, and I use infrared um, because it gives me something different. I think. Uh, uh, I'm the type of guy that doesn't like to go and photograph what other people has photographed already. I, I want to do something different. And uh, for that reason, I actually use other techniques, and one of them is in infrared, to get a different feel and uh, a different composition of my photograph than what other people will do. I take people on, on trips and then there's 10 people with me that photograph the same scene. So I don't want to see that on my own photos as well. It, it seems, though, that many infrared photographers are not good because they shoot infrared. 
there are strong landscape photographers, for example, to start off with. You need to know your composition. Uh, that infrared actually just adds a, a little layer on top that makes it unique, isn't it? That's very important. Uh, um, infrared is not going to be a magical solution mm. to get great photos. You need to understand composition specifically um, on, on your landscapes or whatever you want to photograph. Um, and then this will just give you that extra edge on yeah, top sure. of that. Jan, um, if you could maybe delve in a little bit more um, into some of the technical aspects of um, the different types of infrared filters and, and how this mm. transition from visible light into the spectrum of invisible light works and, and how that responds, because you still end up with a with a visual image uh, for, for our eyes to see, but it's captured with light that's not that visible or partially visible. Can you maybe explain a little bit more what the what the technique tech is behind that yes um we must remember that the sensors that that's inside uh, um, the digital cameras are actually not only sensitive to visible light it's actually sensitive to most light spectrums uh, um, but um, the visible light um, is actually captured by putting a filter in front of a sensor that will um, take out all, all ultraviolet light and all infrared light um, and just captures the visible light. So that's, that's a typical camera. Um, and it starts at the uh, violet uh, uh, color uh, on the, the very uh, um, low bandwidth and it goes up to uh, the red, which is around 680 nanometers uh, spectrum. Um, and then when you actually photograph infrared, it means that you actually shift the colors. Um, so whatever the sensor would normally want to photograph uh, or capture uh, in the violet light color is now all of a sudden red. <laughs> Mm. No, which is on just the to, other just side. Just to be clear, Johan, sorry. Um, when you when you speak about uh, spectrum and nanometers, uh, for for the listeners that don't don't understand, um, is that the, um, the the wavelength frequency? Is that that's correct? right. That's a wavelength frequency of light um, and of of radio signals as well. Obviously, um, the the deeper you go into it, behind infrared, you're going to get to your radio. Um, so, uh, no, no, it's actually on the lower side. Um, but what we want to see is only a visible image at the end of the day. So when you put a filter in front of your camera on, on the lens, um, you actually get uh, the situation, and that's why uh, uh, we actually sometimes want to convert the camera. You get the situation that the, the, there's a filter on, in the camera that actually prevents infrared light to s reach the sensor. Oh. And now we put a filter in front which only allows infrared light in. And the, re the, the result of that is then the fact that you get long exposure because the filters on the, fil on the camera sensor is not so good. <laughs> it will still allow some infrared light through. And um, the, the more infrared light it can allow through, the quicker it will actually capt be captured on the sensor. Um, but a good one will actually take longer. Um, and all cameras are not the same um, with respect of that. Johan, um, talk to us about the filter aspect because I think um, putting an infrared filter onto the sensor is quite an expensive exercise. Mm. So it's probably easier for us to just buy infrared filters. If you were to make a comparison between what an ND filter would do with cutting light mm. and an infrared filter, can you maybe just go through that process? Yes. Um, the, the most popular one to use is the one that is called near-infrared. It's actually uh, 720 nanometers. Uh, if you go back to the film days, uh, the most, most of the infrared films that was used those days started at 750 nanometers. So it's in that same region, and it's called near-infrared because uh, red, visible red, actually ends around about 680 to 700 nanometers uh, in that area. So uh, near-infrared 
is just the things that we can't see with our eyes. Um, and if you put a 720 nanometer uh, filter on a normal camera, you will lose, depending on the filter in, on the sensor, you will lose around about five to seven stops of light. Um, so you get seven, you, you need to uh, expose seven times longer mm. to get, this, uh, to get a, a, a well exposed image. But it's very dependent on the reflection of infrared. So in a cloudy day, for instance, where you don't directly see the sun, it could be 11 to 15 stops sure. difference. Mm. Wow. Um, while in a, 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 a good sunny day with a lot of reflection of uh, 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 green foliage, foliage you, will, you will most probably get like five stops uh, difference. So you want, in the old film days, if you look at the lenses then, it had that little red spot on there marked with an R that said that's the it's the basically the infrared compensation for your focus. Yes. Is there still a difference in focus on the filters on um, the new digital cameras? On on the mirrorless cameras, not. Because it uses a, a, a different technique to focus than the original mm. SLR cameras. And on the SLR cameras, it still had an, a, a difference. Um, so you had to compensate for that. But on the mirrorless cameras, you actually s uh, still focus the same way that you would focus. Um, and I actually, uh, with my uh, Fuji cameras, I actually can get a great, uh, a great uh, uh, photo, uh, and I use it actually on portraits as well, infrared. <laughs> <laughs> I can get a great one in focus at the f1.4 f-stop. Oh, okay. um, wow, that's impressive. Um, Johan, talking about autofocus and the change over from DSLR to mirrorless. Obviously, with DSLR, light will move into the lens, hit the pentaprism. Some of the light will go down to the phase detection filters and then give you autofocus. Where on a mirrorless camera, everything's happening on the sensor as the phase detection filters are basically on the sensor. What is your experience in shooting infrared with both of these technologies? Yeah, I, I think it's it's important to understand that although uh, Fuji also has face detection, but they combine it with contrast detection. Mm. And that's the important part to get the direct uh, um, a photo that is directly uh, um, in focus. Um, with face detection, it is based on uh, the, the, the light uh, uh, that is traveling uh, to and back from your uh, object. While with contrast detection, it is the contrast that is actually captured on, on the sensor that is creating the, um, the focus. And that is why the Fuji cameras are so great with infrared. Uh, it, it really is so easy to, to, uh, to um, get something in focus. Well, Much so easier. Uh, Johan, um, you've mentioned uh, the, the difference between a cloudy day and, and a, f a full on sunny day. But when we start talking about the, the creative possibilities of, of what infrared allows you to, to capture um, and, and obviously being able to capture something that the eye doesn't see, can you maybe give us a couple of examples of things that, um, that, that would appear different from the way you would otherwise shoot um, a regular black and white or color image, you know, different, mm, mm. Uh, different materials and objects and, and how you should go about anticipating what would reflect more infrared light. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, um, the, the first thing, and, and that's the wood effect, mm. um, is, is the thing that in landscapes, green normally reflects a lot more infrared than anything else. So anything that is green will uh, become very bright with real direct sunlight. And that's also what we normally use to create a white balance in the camera. If you want to create a custom white balance in the camera, you actually point your camera to like green grass or to some uh, trees or something like that. And that white balance will then actually result in the trees to become white uh, with uh, normally a, a, a bluish uh, tint in it, um, but then everything else is shifted based on that. So whatever was now green is now close to white or blue, 
and therefore if you go into the spectrum uh, things like the, the the sky that was blue becomes a, a brown amber color and depending on the filter you use um, the greater the color effect you're going to get with that um, if you if you're into monochrome uh, um, uh, photography then uh, 850 nanometer which is at the end of the near infrared red, uh, um, uh, spectrum uh, is actually a greater uh, uh, filter to use. Uh, it will take longer for the exposures, much longer uh, if you use your normal camera. Um, I, I sometimes can actually get like 15 to 20 stops less light wow. <laughs> with that. Um, but it's fantastic for long exposures. So if you want moving clouds or uh, uh, the sea that is uh, uh, um, giving this mist effect, then I actually use an infrared filter for that sometimes, and it gives a great effect. Um, I've got some great examples that I've used that, um, and it's that extra. A lot of people do do long exposures with water, um, but if you then can have that extra that you have a long exposure and you have the effect of infrared on it, it's actually mm. a great one. And I, I use that technique um, uh, uh, quite a number of times in the past on travel. Um, I, uh, uh, some time ago, I think it was around about 2002, I traveled in, in the UK and when I got to Cambridge, I was only there for a morning in Cambridge. And I wanted to photograph all these old buildings. And uh, the problem is it was peak traffic time. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the buildings didn't look great. <laughs> so what I then did is I actually screw my uh, uh, infrared filter on the camera, put it on a tripod, and I got four or five minute exposures at daylight, eight, eight o'clock in the morning, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. And I managed to get Ellie's free of anything. Of course, everything moved past it long before it was actually recorded on the sensor. Um, so I managed to get some really as if I got to Cambridge and there was really nobody there. Yeah. Cool. Photos. Well, you want, there's a lot of work also involved in post-processing, isn't there? Yes. Um, when you photograph in monochrome, uh, I think you, the, the uh, post-processing is not that important. I actually... Uh, photographed not long long time ago at Witsand in the Northern Cape and I used the 815 nanometer uh, filter mostly and put the camera on, on monochrome and the photos were fantastic. You actually don't need any post-processing. But nowadays with a sensor, uh, we uh, capturing it on a digital sensor, we actually like the surrealistic effects that you can actually get with infrared in color. And, but then you need to understand about post-processing. It is a very important tool that you need to understand to, to get great infrared color photos. A couple of quick tips in that regard. Yeah, the, the first one is the fact that uh, um, when you photograph and you've created a custom white balance, as I mentioned previously, then in most cases you get this amber sky. Now, sometimes the amber sky is a great way to actually get already a surrealistic uh, um, image but um, if you want it to to be more realistic yet different um, you actually want to change the sky back to blue um, and we use a technique that is called uh, channel swapping um, that actually does that now, what you do in very simple terms is a few steps the first is you, you use the channel mixer of photoshop and you will take the red channel of uh, um, the photo and change its value. If you, if you open it, you will see if it's, uh, as soon as you click on the red channel, it is 100% red. Mm -hmm. So if you change that to zero, and at the same time for that red channel, you change the blue channel to 100. So you change the one to zero and the other one to 100 then you are basically busy swapping the channels around. So whatever you captured as red all of a sudden becomes blue and vice versa. 
Now, one of my uh, photos that was very successful on, on the salon scene, um, I called the old lady, which is a, a photo that I took in China while traveling there, uh, where I did do the channel swapping. But halfway through, I actually saw, because remember now, you, you need to change the red channel to become blue and the blue channel to become red. So you actually have two steps to do. And halfway through, when I did the one change, um, I noticed that the, uh, uh, the green uh, uh, um, uh, uh, grasses that was actually in the water became a pinkish color. Mm -hmm. And the water is already a bluish color that was initially of amber. So I then stopped. I didn't do anything more. So um, that's an example of an ex a photo that is very surrealistic. Yet, if, if you didn't tell anybody, they will just think that you are a great uh, a fine art photographer <laughs> because of these uh, uh, soft colors that was on the water and the pinkish. It lo looks almost like lilies in the water, which is actually green foliage. Johan, if you, if you pack your bag to go out um, on a typical shoot, you mentioned some filters. Um, what other accessories would you say are important for you in your infrared uh, workflow? Yeah, One thing that people must realize is if you use your normal camera uh, for infrared and you're going to get long exposures, you need to make sure you have a tripod with you. <laughs> so a tripod is, is most probably the most important uh, accessory uh, for infrared because you're going to do long exposures. Um, but then I actually use uh, th uh, three filters. Um, I have a five n 590 nanometer filter. I'll talk about that just now a little bit. And then the 720 and then the 850 nanometer filter. Now the 850 I use, if I see the scene is a typical monochromatic scene that I would like to end up as a monochrome photo, then I'll use the 850 because it creates almost monochrome photos. If you, you, I can actually put a camera on, on Velvia and with an 850 nanometer filter, you need to really inspect the photo to see that there's actually any color in the photo. It actually becomes monochrome. Um, but then I also use 590 nanometer. Now, 590 nanometer is actually visible light. It is orange. It's a deep orange color. So it's all visible deep orange up to the end of red, plus then obviously the infrared. And that um, gives you much more vibrant colors in the infrared, in, in this shifted uh, uh, colors. Um, and it also has the added uh, benefit that if you photograph people, their skin will not have that typical waxy look that you get from a infrared photo of people uh, because you actually capture some visible light and people's skins uh, are actually in, in the spectrum of orange mm. to, to red. So uh, you actually can capture people and get some interesting surrealistic infrared uh, um, portraits that way. Nice. Johan, where can we find you on social media? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the old school type, so my social media skills are not so great. Um, I do have a Facebook page uh, where I actually almost never post any of my photos. <laughs> <laughs> so what website can we go to? So I do have out. my own website. Um, and uh, whenever I post something on my website, I do put a link on my Facebook page to my website. The, the, f the website is johan.vidivalt.net, but Johan is with two N's. I'm, I'm a, a German Johan. Awesome. Thank you, Johan, for joining us and explaining the, the process behind shooting incredible infrared landscape images. Gentlemen, where can we find you on social media? Isli, I'm at uh, Leon Westhuizen on Instagram and leonslens.com is my website and it's also my Facebook page. Uh, you can go and check out our website at www.texma.co.za and my Instagram page at farc1. 
So just a reminder, we have the Fuji Lounge happening on the 15th of July. It will be hosted at Photo ZA in Johannesburg Rosebank area. And there will be discussions on photography. Um, one of our guests, or previous guests, Stanley Calder Pont, is organizing this. Um, he will do something on photography simplified. Um, there will be discussions on family and holiday images, black and white prints, um, a crit review, discussion on long exposures, and also some technical um, advice on both the XT20 and the XT2 cameras. So don't miss it out on the 15th of July. Yes, I like I, that number. I'm actually going to do the crit part. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, cool. And um, you've got something on the 15th of July? Yes, yes, I have. Um, it's down here in Cape Town, and we will be doing a, a photo walk um, the Saturday afternoon uh, in, in the CBD, and it's at a 15th of a second. Uh, and this time, no tripods, Johan. Yes. <laughs> I, I actually proved that I can keep my camera steady for street photography at a tenth of a second. Fantastic. With a, with a uh, 1.435 millimeter lens. Sure. I need to come shake your hand because I don't think anything else will. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Um. Yes, yes, yes. Who got brands talking? Brandlive.co.za.